Jnanati minan tasya jnanjana shalakaya Chakshur militam yena tasma shri guravenama Srimad Bhagavad Gita as it is Translation and commentary by His Divine Grace Shila Isi Bhaktivedanda Swami Prabhupada Pranda Acharya of Iskand Chapter 18, text 65 In the previous verse Lord Krishna stated Sarva guhyatamam bhuya shirame paramam vachaha that now I'm going to tell you, Arjuna, what is the most confidential knowledge, which is my topmost instruction. This Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Vedic knowledge. Vedic knowledge means factual knowledge. It's not like knowledge as is commonly taught in the universities and schools today, in which some experiments are made, some conclusions are reached, and then after some time someone else makes some other some conclusions from some other experiments. This is called the advancement of knowledge. When they find out whatever they considered knowledge previously is considered wrong, and then they find out something else which in due course of time is considered wrong, and they jump from one wrong platform to another and call it knowledge. However, Vedic knowledge is not like that. Ved means vidya, it means knowledge. And this knowledge is given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That this means this knowledge is coming from an absolute source. Absolute means no mistakes. Now, our minds may rebel against such statements. How can we say someone doesn't make any mistakes? Everyone makes mistakes. Well, that's why we need the Vedas. Because everyone in this material world does make mistakes. But Ved means actual knowledge. Actual knowledge means without mistakes. The very fact that we search for knowledge suggests that there is some absolute platform of knowledge. If there is no absolute platform of knowledge, then why do we try to get knowledge at all? What's the point? So, if we come to the absolute platform of knowledge, this is it. Absolute knowledge means that which is free from four defects. Everyone in this material world has four defects, but at least four basic defects which are called Brahm, Pramad, Vipralipsa and Karnapata, which means everyone in this world makes mistakes. Everyone is in illusion. The basic illusion everyone is in is thinking that I am this body. The first teaching of Vedic knowledge is that you are not the body. But due to the illusory energy by which we accept that which is not factual to be factual, everyone identifies that I am this body then everyone has a cheating propensity. Even though we don't know something clearly and conclusively, we like to instruct others. Just like we find in the schools taught evolutionary theory. We are taught that man has descended from animals, but there's no proof. It's a theory. And it's a theory with many, many holes in it. These are called scientific problems. In other words, we have this theory, but there are certain serious problems. But anyway, nevertheless, we'll teach it in the schools. Once I was attend, I, I was um, visiting one science conference in India. So I was going to the hostels where the different speakers were lodged. So I met one professor and I asked him, well, what do you do? He said, I travel around the world and speak at these conferences. So he asked me, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm bringing these books, and I showed him one book called Life Comes from Life. And he said, well, what's, all the, what's this book about? I said, this book shows that evolutionary theory is bogus. So he laughed, and he said that we all know that. So I said, well, why do you still teach it in the schools? He said, well, we didn't come up with any other theory. You have to teach something. This is called cheating. Brahm Pramad, Vipralipsa, Karana Patav. Everyone has imperfect senses. The whole attempt of modern... Uh, the modern system of gaining knowledge is based upon that uh, that which is perceivable by the senses. The basic principle of modern science is that we can only verify something if it's based upon sensual perception. But the basic defect here is that our senses are imperfect. We can only see within a certain spectrum of light. We can only hear within a certain spectrum of sound. We can't see something which is a very long distance away. Nor can we see something which is very close. We can't see our eyelids. So the senses, they are imperfect. And uh, any knowledge attained through the material mind and senses is by these very facts imperfect. So the Vedic knowledge is presented as that knowledge which is beyond these defects. That is factual knowledge. Nothing else can be accepted as factual knowledge. Only knowledge which comes from a source free from these defects which cloud knowledge can be accepted as factual. That's why we'll find in the Krishna conscious movement we tend to make very 
clear-cut statements. For instance, we say that anyone who is not a devotee of Krishna is a rascal. Not only that, but we can classify in four categories. Uh, namely, fools, lowest among mankind, apparently intelligent, but actually not so, and simply demoniac. Now, sometimes when people hear these descriptions, they become disturbed. How can you speak so strongly? It sounds very dogmatic and fanatical. But, actually, this is not our opinion. We are simply repeating the statements of Bhagavad Gita, which is spoken by Krishna, who is accepted as the Supreme Absolute Truth by knowers of the Supreme Absolute Truth. Now, this may sound like what we call circular logic, but factually we see that there are certain people who are highly spiritually advanced, who are in control of their mind and senses, who are uh, highly intelligent and philosophically inclined, and in whose lives it is apparent that they are having transcendental experience, and who are able to communicate this transcendental experience to others, and who uh, consistently repeat the same message, which is based on the message of the Vedas, that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, such people, they are called Acharyas, or persons who uh, are able to teach transcendental knowledge by their very, by the practice of their very lives. So, all these persons accept that Krishna is the Supreme Absolute Truth, and they have established this by uh, highly analytical philosophical exegesis. Again, when we say philosophy, the, un the understanding of Vedic philosophy is different from the idea of modern philosophy. Uh, modern philosophy is based upon mental speculation. That means that by the, the power of one's thinking, one tries to establish some axioms. And then he builds a philosophy based upon these axioms and based upon his experience within this world. But because every person within this world is subject to these de four defects, making mistakes, being illusioned, cheating propensity and imperfect senses. Therefore, all these philosophies fail to reach the absolute truth. And because all these philosophies, they are born of sensory experience Special and uh, mental speculation on the material platform, then by that fact alone, they cannot reach to the transcendental. When we're discussing Vedic knowledge or the higher levels of Vedic knowledge, we're discussing that which is beyond ordinary experience. Vedic philosophy leads us to transcendental experience. That means that which, that which is beyond our normal experience as experienced through the mundane mind and senses. So that is the platform of correctness. It's understandable that materialists, they, they're not very sh sure of something being stated so clearly and correctly. Because on the material platform, you can never be sure of anything. But the transcendental platform is different. The transcendental platform is one of absolute knowledge. Therefore, we see here Krishna speaking very clearly. Throughout Bhagavad Gita, he makes statements. He speaks to Arjuna in an authoritative way. He doesn't say to Arjuna, well, you know, what do you think about this? This is, this is my idea, what's your idea? He doesn't speak like that. Hey, you know, Arjuna, I think I'm God, what do you think? Yeah, pretty good idea, Krishna. He doesn't speak like that. Arjuna says, Sarva me tadritangman ye yanman vadisikeshava. I accept everything you say as truth. Now, if we hear this, we may think, oh, it sounds like a, some kind of brainwashing going on here. Brainwashing, yes, cleaning the brain, cleaning it of all wrong conception. Uh, we are reluctant to accept in, in such a committed way anything or anybody because we recognize that in this material world people are going to be wrong and they're going to cheat us. But Arjuna accepted Krishna not simply out of some blind faith but because he recognized his transcendental position and was therefore ready to accept what he said. Accepting transcendental knowledge means being ready to accept it. It requires coming off the platform of maybe this, maybe that, and being ready to accept that there is knowledge which is factual, clear, direct, and unquestionable. Unquestionable means we may inquire, how is it like this, how is it like that? But those inquiries should be on the basis of thinking that well, I don't understand. Not that the position of absolute knowledge is wrong, but simply I don't understand it. So this is the way Vedic knowledge is to be received. It requires faith. And that is a fact. Now, uh, 
mostly in the modern age people they're skeptical about having absolute faith but there is no other way to receive transcendental knowledge that faith however is not supposed to be blind God has given us intelligence and he expects us to use it but at the same time our intel- we should be intelligent enough to understand that by our intelligence alone we cannot understand everything therefore it's really intelligent if we want to come to a higher platform of understanding to submit our intelligence to those who are on the higher platform logical analysis is not rejected in vedic understanding but at the same time it's understood that we can't understand everything simply by logical understanding some things we have to accept at least in the, in the beginning at least theoretically for instance in krishna consciousness when people come newly we ask them please chant hari krishna now if we start to chant hari krishna we may not know exactly what happens what will be the effect but we can make an experiment we see that those who are chanting hari krishna they generally seem to be very happy people Definitely. so we may think let me try also and with that initial faith if we do chant then we also begin to feel the happiness of krishna consciousness and with that initial uh, experience we may feel encouraged to go a little deeper into krishna consciousness in this way gradually we can commit ourselves and uh, begin to have transcendental experiences so these transcendental experiences it's not like some kind of intoxication but uh, factually the devotee feels the presence of krishna in his life and by receiving vedic knowledge knowledge of krishna he begins to appreciate krishna's presence in everything and how everything is under the control of krishna so as one practices krishna consciousness he begins to experience krishna consciousness that increases his faith his commitment goes deeper in this way the aspiring devotee feels encouragement to go further in krishna consciousness but ultimately to enter into krishna consciousness that uh, commitment is required krishna is speaking in a absolute way to arjuna because arjuna at the very beginning has submitted himself as a disciple to krishna this uh, method of giving absolute knowledge is not meant to be spoken to those who are highly doubtful it's meant to be spoken to those who are that much committed that they're ready to accept the message of krishna it's understood that not everyone is ready to accept that only people who have performed pious activities in previous lives can understand this yesham tvantakatam papam jananam punya karmanam tedvan vamoha nirmukta bhajanti mangdura vrataha krishna says in the bhagavad gita that people who have performed pious activities in previous lives and in this life and who are free from the duality of delusion can engage in my devotional service with determination so it requires some qualification to take up this knowledge the qualification is that one should be uh, purified enough and of clear enough consciousness to submissively accept the message of krishna however that not everyone is ready to accept this message doesn't make doesn't mean that it's only true for some and not true for everybody what krishna speaks is the absolute truth it's simply that not everyone is re- ready to receive that so on this basis uh, krishna is speaking to arjuna bhagavad gita and here he comes to the ultimate point the most confidential point of knowledge which is to think of krishna to be his devotee to worship krishna this is the ultimate point of absolute knowledge those who are not advanced they can't accept this sometimes people think advanced means that you exercise your own intelligence and your own free powers of thinking but krishna is different idea of what is the absolute perfection what is the highest perfection of the living beings the highest perfection of the living being is to submit himself to krishna so i may think well how is that the highest perfection you think the highest perfection is to become god yourself how can it be the highest perfection if you submit to someone else because that means you're lower than someone else so how that can be that that be the highest position that that is the highest position for the living beings the highest position of all is that of god and the highest position for the living beings is to understand that i cannot be god you can't go that high you can't become god some people teach this that you can become god anyone who says that is a fool how can you become god it's a ridiculous proposition god is always god you don't become god 
It's a ridiculous proposition. So anyone who is saying like that, they're not only a fool, but they are a rascal. Because they're deliberately misleading you. You can't become God. God means the supreme controller, the knower of everything, who is in the heart of every living being. God means the supreme controller. So we're not the supreme controller. It doesn't need much philosophical anal- analysis to understand that. We we may be dreaming, I am the supreme controller. But then all of a sudden we feel, oh, I have to run to the toilet quickly. Uh, you can't even control the in- in movements of your intestines. And you imagine yourself to be the supreme controller. So sanity means to accept that I am controlled. And knowledge of our factual position is to know who is controlling us. That is Krishna. So our highest position is simply to accept our low position. Everyone in this material world is trying to be a big shot. As the residents of this neighborhood know, uh, every dog is trying to bark louder than everyone else. Who will be the loudest barking dog? Everyone is competing to be better than others. But we are tiny, 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 tiny living beings. And Krishna, the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead, is unlimitedly great. Therefore, our position is simply to worship Krishna. Now, if we hear that, we may think, oh, then I'll be a failure. Now, that is a success. When we hear, I have to surrender, oh, no, I I wanted to conquer, I didn't want to surrender. But ultimate intelligence means to know our own limits. We're not God. Sorry, folks. You're never going to be God. But we can be unlimitedly happy in the service of Krishna and service of God. It's not that to be a servant of God means you have to go and just like there's the tram factory. God has, God has you working in, in the factory 24 hours a day with whipping you. Not like that. To be the servant of God means to jo- enjoy equally with God. There we see the picture of Krishna running with the cowherd boy. So these are servants of God in an eternally happy position. So Krishna is speaking to us very strongly and directly. Surrender to me. Think of me. It's, he's not like some kind of uh, charismatic dictator like Stalin or Mao Zedong, someone like that, who makes propaganda. Think of me. They're trying to imitate God by controlling everybody by force. But there's no benefit of thinking of Stalin or Mao. Of course, the benefit while living under their regimes was means, mean, would be that uh, maybe you could escape execution. But Krishna is not forcing us to surrender to him. He is speaking straightforwardly, but he gives us the choice. You surrender to me, that is for your own benefit, do it. And if you don't want to, that you can also do. Of course, you have to suffer repeated birth and death in this material world, and you can't enjoy, you can't join with Krishna's blissful pastimes. But Krishna is not forcing us to surrender to him. He's simply offering us this highest and most confidential knowledge for our own benefit. So even though this knowledge is the highest, it's meant for everybody. Not everybody may take it because most people are still caught up in illusory notions of enjoying this material world. Only a person who is highly advanced in consciousness can accept Krishna's message. Those who do become fortunate. Fortune is that upon leaving this body, they go to Krishna to live happily with Krishna eternally. When we say live happily, you might think, well, you know, maybe I get $10,000 a month and... uh, a Mercedes car. But the standard of happiness in the spiritual world is completely different from that of the material world. In the material world, everyone is trying to make arrangements for their comfort and prestige, but they're never happy. But in the spiritual world, you can see everyone is living very simply. And the basis of happiness is their love for Krishna. So this is the essence of Krishna's confidential teaching. He's saying, think of me, surrender to me. First, we have to accept Krishna's supremacy and our subordination to him. But the platform of love of Krishna begins from this surrender. First, it is, it is required that we surrender to Krishna, that we accept Krishna's supremacy. And having done that, then we can enter into an intimate relationship with Krishna, which is on a platform of love unimagined in this material world. People in this material world imagine love to be some kind of romantic feeling. They have no idea of the uh, platform of love of Krishna, which is entirely selfless, in which uh, Krishna reciprocates unlimitedly and the devotees flow of love to Krishna that also expands unlimitedly. So the beginning practice for entering into that love is simply to cultivate 
practice remembering Krishna. That's also not difficult to do. Krishna consciousness is very simple. It begins with chanting the holy names of Krishna. Everyone can do that. That's also very enjoyable. And from this chanting, the reawakening of our love of Krishna begins. And gradually there are so many other points to follow, all with the ultimate aim of awakening our consciousness of Krishna, so much so that we gradually come to the platform of always remembering Krishna. This is the most confidential part of knowledge. The end of all knowledge is simply to think of Krishna. That is the purpose of this Krishna conscious movement, to cultivate knowledge of Krishna among its members and to propagate knowledge of Krishna to the public in general who are suffering so much simply because they are not conscious of Krishna. Manmana bhava madhakto madhyaji maang namaskuru vame vaishyasi satyante pratijane priyosi me Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer your homage unto me. Thus you will come to me without fail. I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any question please? Uh, yeah, okay. Krishna has six uh, uh, opulences, mm. uh, but the only thing he doesn't have is our love. Why is so? Why doesn't have Krishna have our love? Well, because we're such rascals, we don't give it to him. He's not uh, lacking because of our lack of love. Krishna Nadawa has Mahesh. the love of Radharani, all the gopis, Nanda Maharaj, Mother Yashoda, all the residents of Vrindavan, Natura and Dwarka. He's not that he's lacking because... Of, uh, because we don't love him. But he feels sorry that we don't love him. And how we are spoiling our existence. Therefore he kindly comes and speaks Bhagavad Gita to take us out of this ignorance. Why well, is so that uh, Lord Brahma is sometimes an illusion and forgets Krishna and thinks in the ordinary person? Well, why is anyone in illusion? It means they are under the influence of some illusory potency. There are, there are two phases of illusory potency. One is called Mahamaya and another is called Yogamaya. Mahamaya means the illusory potency by which those who are not fully surrendered, those who are not surrendered to Krishna or those who are not fully surrendered to Krishna are illusioned about Krishna's supremacy. And Yogamaya is Krishna's internal potency for affecting his spiritual pastimes by which devotees, uh, they may forget Krishna's supremacy for the sake of enjoying intimate pastimes with him. Now, sometimes the post of Brahma is filled by someone who is a pure devotee and sometimes it is filled by a, a very pious person who is nevertheless not a fully pure devotee. So if Brahma is not a fully pure devotee then he's going to be influenced by the external illusory potency of Krishna. But even pure devotees, they're sometimes by the influence of the internal potency appear to be influenced by the external potency for the sake of affecting Krishna's pastimes or for the sake of demonstrating some uh, facet of Krishna consciousness. Just like we see here, Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, he appears to be materially conditioned. He, feel, he appears to be confused like an ordinary person. But the result of that apparent confusion was that Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita for the benefit of all living beings. Now you could say, well, Krishna could have spoken that to anybody. He could have spoken it to an actually conditioned soul. But Krishna says, Bhakto Sime Sakha Chaiti Rahasyam Hyatet Uttamam. I'm speaking this knowledge to you because you are my friend and my devotee. Because Arjuna, although apparently an illusion, had the proper attitude of submission to Krishna, he was able to understand Bhagavad Gita. Whereas if that had been spoken to some atheist who didn't have any faith in Krishna, then uh, Krishna would still be speaking now, trying to make him understand. Because the atheists deny to understand Krishna, and therefore they can't understand. So, not only Brahma, but in many cases, it's sometimes seen that those who are understood to be pure devotees appear to be acting as if in a materialistic way. Krishna teaches in Bhagavad Gita. But, yeah. Apichet sudara charo bhajate mamananya bhak sadhureva samantavya that one who is ananya bhak, one whose purpose of life is holy and solely to worship me, even if he apparently uh, commits some very bad activities, he's still to be considered a devotee and a saintly person. 
we have to see what is the main purpose of his life. And if there's any apparent uh, deviation from that, which is, which is temporary, if we see that in the life of a great soul, we should understand that actually he's not fallen, but he may be being put into illusion for the sake of demonstrating some point to us. This is the proper way to understand it. Otherwise, if we start saying, well, you know, Brahma, he's just a conditioned soul, if we start thinking like that, then the mercy that we require to receive from Krishna, to understand Krishna, is withdrawn from us. We become offensive. And our ability to understand the transcendental recedes. We start to see all devotees as impure we start to see mistakes in Krishna himself. So many people criticize Krishna. They will say he is immoral, he's a liar, and so many things. If you see like that, then your Krishna consciousness is lost. You become an offender. You go to hell. So we have to be very careful when we are considering Krishna and his pure devotees. Is it possible to be glad to be on this planet? I don't. Uh, he doesn't mean to be happy, but to be, just to be glad that we're here. Is it possible? Many people feel like that. The pig, he's feeling happy. You see, they bring all the garbage food and he's wagging his tail and thinking, I'm so happy. He doesn't consider that he's getting fatter and fatter and fatter. And the farmer is also getting glad. Oh, the pig is getting so fat, I'll get a good price for him. So it's possible to be happy, but we should consider on what platform that happiness is. Anyone who considers that I have to die, I have to suffer in so many different ways, I don't know where I'm going after death. I simply have to be reborn to struggle and suffer again and again. But Anyone who considers like that, how can you be very happy? Just like uh, if I say to I bring one gun and put it at your head and say that within 15 minutes I'm going to shoot you dead. So in the meantime, what do you want to do? We can provide for you any beautiful girl you like any food you like, any movie you like to see. Yes. Enjoy to the fullest extent for 15 minutes and after that your brains are going to be on the floor. So will, will you become very enthusiastic to enjoy? Oh, you mean I can have Miss World? <laughs> <laughs> so that's our position. We are enjoying, we're happy, but in a short time we're going to have to die. And then, where will we go? We may become a demigod like Brahma, not very likely. But we may become a pig, a worm. We may, be, you know, we may be born and again to work in the tram factory. Material life means simply struggle and suffering. We may try to forget this, but actually death, and disappointment, disease, these things come to everybody. So, real intelligence means to make a solution to this to get out of this situation. Sometimes people say, well, this Krishna consciousness is very pessimistic. It's Why don't you be happy? You know, well, life's not so bad. But we're not pessimistic, we're realistic. Life is bad. Death is disgusting. Old age is suffering. Disease is suffering. And to have to be reborn again and again and again to suffer these things is a condition of suffering. So we're not pessimistic, we're realistic. Material life is like this. But at the same time, we are very optimistic. We are happy people. We're always dancing and singing. People who are unhappy don't do that. Usually, uh, people, for, to get dancing and singing, they require a certain intake of alcohol. But that, that drunken dancing, that's not actual happiness. But devotees of Krishna, they're so enthusiastic about Krishna conscious, they're rising by four o'clock every morning, even in the winter, to dance and sing early in the morning. Because they found something to be really glad about. If you're really glad about something, you don't just sing about it once or twice and then forget it. But if there is something really valuable in life, it's worth singing and dancing about all your life. So devotees are singing and dancing and happy because they've found Krishna. Yeah. And they know that by this singing and dancing, they will, upon leaving the body, go to the spiritual world to continue singing and dancing for Krishna forever. So the real happiness of happy, the real platform of happiness is Krishna consciousness. The other happiness that is uh, foolish happiness of the pig. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, these statements may seem to be very devastating, but actually, it's a fact. The whole of material life is simply uh, struggling to try and get some happiness, which ultimately we don't get. And for all our endeavors to be happy, ultimately death comes and forces us to be born in some situation which is not under our control. 
you may think, well, I'm very happy and carefree, but, uh, you know, if you, if you, you can be born as a snake or a rat or any other horrible position. Correct. The actual Correct. fact is that the laws of material Correct. nature are, are highly stringent. Anyway, you're not going to be born as a snake or a rat because you're chanting Hare Krishna. But as you're chanting Hare Krishna, why not go all the way and become perfect in chanting Hare Krishna? If you like chanting Hare Krishna, well, why not do what is required to do that eternally? You like singing and dancing and music? Well, so do we. So does Krishna. So you can do that eternally with Krishna. In this material world, there's no such guarantee. We may be forced into different situations where there's no such happiness. So it means that it's better to be with Krishna, not here. Yeah, that's true. You got it. You can be with Krishna here also. The Krishna conscious wound is meant for exactly that. What does Krishna conscious mean? To be conscious of Krishna, even here. Uh, Krishna conscious means to live in the spiritual world even while we're in the material world. The example is given of um, a caterpillar goes from one leaf to another. So there's one leaf, another leaf. He puts his body on the on this leaf and then he transfers himself and leaves the other leaf. So okay. his body's on one leaf, he puts it on the other leaf, he's on both leaves and then he transfers to the other leaf. So we're in the material world and then we have to transfer, we have to transfer our consciousness into spiritual consciousness or Krishna consciousness and then when we're fully ready we just leave the material world behind and we go to the spiritual world. So if you like Krishna consciousness, well, why not go the whole way? You don't lose anything. You lose uh, repeated birth and death. Well, that's worth losing. You gain eternal life, singing and dancing with Krishna. See, generally we think uh, music, that makes us very happy. But you see, there are so many musicians who, uh, they died horrible deaths or they committed suicide or whatever. How many names shall we say? Modern famous musicians, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Brian Davis, Jimi Hendrix. How many of them all died horrible deaths? Their music ultimately didn't liberate them. So actually that music, that's simply an expression of their egotism. But uh, Krishna conscious music, it's an expression of the joy of knowing Krishna. It's a different quality of music. The, 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 the reason why these musicians love this world is because they were unhappy here. They must have been unhappy. If you don't know Krishna, you must be unhappy. I mean, mostly this rock music, it's, you know, it's like a very intensely egotistic it's a expression of tremendous frustration. I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> and it's grinding and banging and it's like you know, just pouring out your. It's pouring out your suffering. Actually, there's there's no solution in that. The solution is to glorify Krishna. That's the real platform of happiness. I mean, you see, you see in that Woodstock movie that I saw. I mean, I saw so many years ago. Janis Joplin having a nervous breakdown and on the stage. And uh, uh, what do you expect if you you make a living out of screaming and yelling? And no one in this material world is happy. Even those who Think they're happy. They're, it's it's they they've covered them. They've covered their unhappiness with a veneer of happiness, but un, inside they're suffering. Often we see just like comedians. We think, well, they must be very happy because they're always laughing and joking. But usually they're laughing and joking. It's just to cover up that inside they're so much frustrated. And everyone's like that. You know, some people take pleasure in doing business and or politics and trying to become rich or trying to become famous, uh, powerful. They're simply frustrated. They're not happy at all. But there is a difference between being glad and uh, be happy. being happy. And he was asking if somebody can be glad on this planet. Yeah, yeah, you can be glad. That's what we're saying. Just like the pig is glad. He's not happy though. Happiness means when there's no internal frustration, that the uh, one's soul is fully full of joy. Well, there's a science to understand how we can come to that position. We're meant to be like that. Why are we trying to be happy? Why do people come from all over the world to Prague to look at the buildings? And uh, why do why are people from all over the world trying to go to America to yeah, make some money? Why do some people like jazz music, some people like rock music, some people like waltz and ballroom dancing... Some people like eating hamburgers, some people like eating sausages, some people like vegetarian food. Why all these? Why do people go to the movies? Why do they work in the tram factory or any other factory? 
because they're thinking that from this we will get happiness. Everyone is searching for happiness. So that every, that everyone is searching for happiness suggests that there is some platform of happiness. Unfortunately, we don't know what the actual platform of happiness is. So the Vedic literature informs us that we are spiritual beings. We are not the body. The body is temporary. I am eternal. I am a soul. I live forever. Before this body existed, I existed. After this body drops down dead and is burned or thrown in the ground, I will continue to exist. I am an eternal soul. I can't be happy on the platform of the body or even on the platform of the mind, which is also material. I have to know what my spiritual need is. So that information we get from the Vedic literature, which gives us spiritual knowledge, that as spiritual living beings, we have an eternal relationship on the spiritual platform with Krishna, who is the supreme spiritual being, who is the reservoir of transcendental bliss and love and joy and all transcendental qualities. So our constitutional position is to be in consciousness of Krishna. And if we're conscious of Krishna, then we'll be happy. And as long as we're not, we can't be happy. Just like a fish, just to give the example, a fish, if you take it out of water, it can't be happy. If you give a fish, uh, you know, a cigar and a bottle of wine and anything else that you might think might make someone happy, he won't be happy. If you bring him Miss Fish of the Year, Miss <laughs> Universal Fish, the most beautiful fish, she opens and closes her mouth. It's so enchanting. You have such beautiful slime. So uh, he can't enjoy because he's not in the water. He's not in his proper position. So in the same way as spiritual beings, we can't enjoy, we can't be happy, we can't be satisfied on the material platform. We have to come to our real position in relationship with Krishna then. We'll naturally be happy by that fact alone. Please chant Hare Krishna. Try to understand there's no real happiness in this material world. Even if we think there's happiness, it's limited by time. We won't be in these bodies for very long. How old are you? 34. 34. So maybe you'll live as long as you've lived already in the same body. And maybe even a little more. Maybe. But not much more than that. So we really don't have much time in these bodies before we have to move on. And you know, by the time you reach 34, it's already, physically, it's just down, 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 all the way down to death, isn't it? When you're young, you have lots of energy. But then gradually, one day you're combing your hair in the mirror and you see some lines on your face. And gradually the lines increase, gradually the energy flows out of your body. And by the time you reach old age, even to do ordinary things such as walking up the stairs can become a very great endeavor, very uh, difficult. I remember seeing one old man in India. He said, uh, when I was your age, I was a wrestling champion. He said, I could pick up two people like you and throw them across the room at the same time. <laughs> but he said, now if I want to walk up the stairs, I need one person on each side to help me. I can't go anywhere without anyone helping me. See, that's uh, everyone's situation. I am the greatest, said Muhammad Ali, uh, boxing yeah. champion. But, uh, you know, you put him in a, his... Uh, no one could touch him because he's always moving or always dodging the punches. Huh. But if you put him in the ring now, then, I mean, you could just use him as a punch bag. <laughs> Whatever that uh, in youth we feel some exuberance. But, uh, you know... It all just fades away gradually. So those who put their faith in uh, in material happiness, they're they're disappointed. But those who develop transcendental happiness, then even in the old age of the body, they don't experience any distress. Stay young forever. We are young. We're not old. The soul is eternal, eternally young. Old age and death are conditions of the body. Can we be glad then? We can be glad. We, we can be glad. We're chanting Hare Krishna, we're very glad. <laughs> he was asking if we can be glad that we have appeared on this planet. To yes, yes, yes. We're very glad. We're chanting Hare Krishna. We are very glad. We have Hare. something to be glad about. We're on this planet and fortunately we are chanting Hare Krishna. Something to be glad about. And it is our fortunate view on this planet? 
It's our fortune that we're here on this planet and we have the chance to chant Hare Krishna. Otherwise, what's the fortune of simply getting born and dying again? You're born, you struggle, you pass stool and you die. How many times you pass urine and stool in your life? It must be about 50. The average person must do it about 50,000 times in their life. There's got to be a better, better existence than this. And you get so many old people, they can't control their bladders, so the urine just comes uh, spilling uh. out. Material life is miserable. We are convinced. If you're not convinced, it's up to you. It doesn't mean it's any less miserable. But there is hope. There's Krishna consciousness. You can get any prasadam. Give him a plate of prasadam. <laughs> He already took. Already took? Yeah, he took fish with the I see, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he, he takes it as an instruction, so he accepts. Jai.